A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on March 10th, 2021. I am your host, Anna Garcia. And our special guest this week is Mike King, who's worked in law enforcement for more than 30 years. He's worked several high profile serial killer cases and he's got a new book out and it's called Deceived an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. Wow, (laughs) that's scary. Plus, you also have a YouTube show called Profiling Evil. Mike, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, Anna. It is such an honor to be here. I'm a fan, and this is just awesome. Thanks. Oh, you're awfully kind. You're very sweet. We are going to talk about your book at the end of the program, really get into it. But just to understand, you know, what motivates you um, and the kinds of cases that really get you going, just so our audience can understand. You know, I've I've always been interested in the behavior of criminal offenders. And so I, uh, early in my career, started focusing on behavior. I was fortunate to be trained by FBI profilers in profiling and uh, and spent much of my career just taking all of the traditional forms of evidence that we're so used to looking at and kind of setting them on a shelf for just a short season and then re-examining the case from a behavioral perspective And I think what it does is just opens up so many possibilities that we don't normally consider once we start applying behavior to all of these other forms of evidence. And and it makes a much more rich investigation. I think it helps us understand what motivates an offender, really gets their motor going. And, uh, And it helps us understand why they select the kind of victims they select. Interesting. Well, we've got two cases today where I think both the victim and those around the victim had all sorts of potential suspicious behavior, if you will. Uh, So let's get into the cases. I can't wait to hear what you think about them. And I know you're familiar with both cases as well. So that's going to be very helpful. So these are the cases we have this week. The husband of a missing Colorado mom has sold their family home. This is 10 months after the wife's mysterious disappearance. Now, there's nothing criminal about selling the home. It's curious. That's the word I'm going to use on this one. I'm going to say curious. But first, an update on a case that we have been following here and that I covered for Crime Watch Daily. And we finally have an update here on a case that has really, it's haunted a lot of you. Uh, It touched your hearts. Eight years later, eight years after 21-year-old Kelsey Schelling went missing in Colorado, her boyfriend, Dante Lucas, has been found guilty of first-degree murder and has been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And Kelsey's body has never been found. And that, Mike, was always the delay in this case, because when I I met Kelsey's family back in 2017, this is before there were any arrests or anything, you know, the case had been cold for years and years, and there was such a frustration because there were some suspicions, but her boyfriend had never, ever been called a suspect, the most he ever was publicly named by police at the time, was a person of interest. But lots of people can be persons of interest. And I think the fact that they they never found her, still haven't found her body, we find that prosecutors don't really like to prosecute those kind of murder cases. They're tough. This one, I think, was even tougher because there wasn't really much in forensics. There wasn't much in the way of, you know, sometimes you'll find massive amounts of blood, let's say in a car or at a scene or anything like that. They didn't have that here. They didn't have any of that. Yeah, I thought this was really intriguing from that perspective. And and that the courage of the prosecutor to tackle a circumstantial case like this, I really was so uh, proud of the prosecutor in this case. But the thing I thought was interesting, Anna, is 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we may not have even tried this case because it relied on uh, computer forensics, cell phone forensics. Um, we, we gained more um, 
more interest in what cadaver dogs can do and how valuable a cadaver dog can be in an investigation. But but this one really, um, I think, looks at behavior as well. I think you're right. So the verdict just came in this on Monday, this last Monday, March 8th. The jury took just four hours to deliberate. And one of the many fascinating things about this case, and there are a lot, is that the lawyers defending Dante Lucas never presented one witness, not one person in their defense, meaning the prosecution presented its case. This case took a few weeks to do, COVID and everything. And they, of course, cross-examined. But when it came for the defense to present their case, they, they didn't do anything. I mean, they did not present a witness, including Dante's own mother and grandmother, both of whom were called by the prosecution to testify against Dante. They didn't provide an awful lot of evidence, I believe, to the jury. But when your own mother can't even testify in your own defense, I, I think there's some complications because we've never found Kelsey and some of the areas that were dug up was, you know, were or where she was believed to last be seen was the grandmother's house. So I suppose that would have opened up a can of worms for the defense had they been put back up on the stand. But nonetheless, I found that very fascinating. Let's get into some of the details, and then I really want to hear about your behavior and your mapping analysis on this. Kelsey disappeared on February 4th of 2013. She was driving from her home in Denver to Pueblo, Colorado, which is about two hours away. She was going to go see her boyfriend, Dante Lucas, who lived there. She had just recently found out that she was eight weeks pregnant, she said, with Dante's baby. She'd gone to the doctor. They had the sonogram. She had texted photos of the sonogram to her family, so her family knew she was pregnant. She also, according to all the cell phone records, sent those uh, pictures of the sonogram to Dante and Dante's mother. And we were told through friends and family, and this, of course, all came out in um the court case, that Dante and his mom were not too happy about this. And then text messages are going to reveal a different narrative and story of what was going on here. So um, Kelsey goes to Pueblo. And, and part of the reason she's going to Pueblo is because Dante has said to her, I need to talk to you in person and I have a surprise for you, right? Yeah. Those were text messages sent from Dante to Kelsey. So the next day, Kelsey's parents have not heard from her, and her friends have not heard from her, but there is some form of bizarre communication. By bizarre, I mean that uh, it came out in the court because police were tight-lipped for many, many years about things, as you can understand, because Dante had never had not been arrested for years. So the communications, according to the prosecutor, indicate that Kelsey's phone was communicating with Kelsey's family, but they suggest that the person who was writing these text messages was actually Dante, and that Dante was in communication with Kelsey's mom. Kelsey's mom said to me when I interviewed her, she said, you know, one of the things that bothered me was when I called Dante and said, oh my God, I haven't heard from Kelsey, where is she? And he wasn't worried, he wasn't freaked out, and that bothered her, that there was no sense of urgency. But prosecutors say he bought himself some time by saying, oh, I just talked to her. She's going to go to California. Oh, her phone is broken. That's why you can't reach her. So there were, so there was this mixed communication going on that could make you wonder, okay, well, that's possible. Um, and by the time they filed the police report, by the time the parents filed the missing persons report, Kelsey had been missing for days, for days. Yeah. Um. What do you make of that? You know, the, the whole thing from, from day one is so troubling because we think about the emotion of Kelsey, who wanted a father involved in this new child that's coming. And so you see her maybe putting her own ideals into what his responses are when he's saying, I have a surprise for you. And I can just see her in her mind fantasizing that, oh, he's finally come around and, and I'm going to go down there and we're going to become a happy family like I always dreamed about. Um, she gets there and he starts this manipulation. I mean, the moment she gets there, she leaves at 10 o'clock at night after she gets off work. Anna. that that alone bugs me of what kind of a man would do that 
to someone that he loves instead of getting in a car and racing up there himself, you know. But uh, he gets her to drive down at, at midnight. She she sits in the parking lot of the Walmart for almost an hour, texting, saying, where are you? And he says, hey, meet me over here, which happens to be just across the street from his grandmother's house where he's been hanging out. And whether she really made it there or not, Anna, I think that becomes a real interesting question we may never know the answer to. He may have had control of both phones by then and starts manipulating these conversations. But then we see over the course of a day, these these conversations and tweets that are going back and forth, or messages, I mean, not tweets, that aren't characteristic of the way that Kelsey would respond. And the family just thinks, oh, she's under a lot of stress or something, and it does buy him these days. But that's what really becomes uh, that circumstantial evidence that the prosecution can use later to just collapse his house of cards and say, no, no, this didn't make sense from the beginning. And in real time, as as I always like to do things chronologically, because I think it really helps people understand what police maybe were up against and what was and wasn't making sense at the time. So there are these weird communications coming from Kelsey's phone, presumably from Kelsey, that delays filing that report. Once the police report is finally filed, you know, a missing persons case, when you're dealing with an adult, as you know, is I'm not going to say it's met with skepticism, but there's a sense on the part of authorities, if it's not a minor, that, well, she is an adult. And if she said she was, yeah. her fam, friends say she's going to California, maybe that's where she went, right? So it isn't until her car is found abandoned at a hospital parking lot that police really step it up and say, ooh, this looks like foul play. Right. Yeah. So at that point, it's about 10 days later. It would be Valentine's Day, February 14th, when her car is found in the parking lot. So now police start searching the surveillance cameras in the area. And that's when we discover that her car was parked in the Walmart parking lot for 18 hours. And police say that you can see a man in a hoodie walking to her car, driving in, getting oh, getting out, but they can't make that man out for sure. And Dante's very tall. He's 6'8". But no one can tell you for sure what's going on there. And then they find something else. So you've got the car that's sitting there for 18 hours. That's very bizarre. And then how did it get from there to the place where it was found? Then something else happens. So The day after Kelsey is last seen alive, Dante, according to police, is captured on the camera of an ATM, and he is withdrawing cash from Kelsey's account. Okay, he gets picked up by the police, potentially for potential identity fraud or or anything like that, you know, uh, related, potential related charges, but But they end up releasing him because he says, Kelsey gave me the password. I had the password. I've used this card before. And therefore, with the fact that I had Kelsey's permission, which I don't, the police, I don't think ever doubted that, that part of the story that he had permission to use her ATM card. Okay, so here's where I want you to explain to me the whole phone thing. So Dante goes through the ATM, takes money out of Kelsey's account the day after she's last seen alive. But according to the forensics of the phones, her cell phone is in the car, according to police, with him. But you don't see Kelsey in the car. So why would he have Kelsey's cell phone? But where is Kelsey? Yeah. And if I I remember that story correctly, he's even projecting that she may still be at the hospital getting an exam and potentially losing the baby at the time he's withdrawing the money. But the thing that's so interesting to me is this uh, cell phone location thing is an interesting science. It's actually called triangulation, and it goes off of three different cell towers and, and says this phone is somewhere in this area. So when we look on our phones, we see that little circle that says you're somewhere in this range on your phone right now. And and if we pick up a Wi-Fi signal or we're in our homes and that little circle gets smaller and smaller or more accurate because it's now using 
triangulation, the cell towers, and wireless. Well, the FBI was only able to say that it was in a certain range. It's called a certainty range. And both phones were fitting within that. So they could have even been, you know, hundreds of feet, maybe um, hundreds of yards apart from each other. But they're going to show up in that same sector until you get the device location, the actual XY coordinate in the phone. And I don't know if they had that or not, but what they do have is that every time there's a communication, they're showing those two phones are in the same sector or the same area. Um, they're close in proximity, which doesn't match his verbal testimony of where he is and she is. What is also very interesting here is that there are additional text messages that are very confusing. There's a series of text messages from Sarah Lucas, Dante's mother, to Kelsey, saying, oh, I'm so sorry you lost the baby. I'm sorry you had to go through this yourself. And Dante told police that she wasn't pregnant anymore. He was not very clear on how she wasn't pregnant anymore, but apparently that morning she got a sonogram and was pregnant but by the night, by the time she got to Pueblo, she wasn't pregnant, according to Dante and Dante's mother. So those text messages were, you know, kind of interesting, right? Okay, so a few years go by and nothing happens, right? That's all the information we have so far. And, in, and as the case is getting colder in 2015... Kelsey's family sues the Pueblo Police Department, alleging obstruction of the investigation. And then supporters start showing up and protesting outside of the police station, demanding justice for Kelsey. So the family really puts the pressure because from puts up the pressure significantly because they feel like this case is stone cold. At about this time, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation gets involved. And in 2017, there seems to be some movement. The lawsuit is dropped. The CBI is involved. They've put a, a different person in charge of the investigation. And then they dig up Dante's grandmother's yard with a cadaver dog. Even in the court case, while... The, they say that the dog picked up a scent again. There wasn't anything that was substantial from my understanding as far as physical evidence that a murder was committed. That's kind yeah. of like, how do you weigh the value? Because cadaver dogs are going to come and play in the next case that we're going to talk about. How do you place a value on the accuracy and the significance of cadaver dogs. Yeah, I think I think what we have to do first is look at the history of the dog itself and whether the dog is proven to the when they alert and, and some alert by laying down, others, you know, whatever that alert is, the history of the alerts and was a body recovered when that dog alerted. So these dogs act in specific ways when they alert on a piece of body tissue that they smell. And that's, got, that's um, validated through testing. It's validated through body finds that they actually have. So that's what gives us the ability to say this dog is certified, reliable, trustworthy, and enough that we should be able to get a search warrant based on the history of this animal. Um, I, I think what really becomes important in this particular case is that there often are several different crime scenes. There could be the place where the actual murder occurs and then a disposal site or multiple disposal sites as the offender works through, how am I going to clean my hands of this thing? And so it, it isn't troubling necessarily that the dog might alert in different areas. The thing that becomes, I think, important, and you speak to it better than I do, is the evidentiary chain of that information. You know, that floor mat that they talked about, was that immediately seized and packaged? So that when a dog alerts on it, it hasn't been contaminated by anything else. You Just so everyone can follow, you're referring to the floor mat of Kelsey's car. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, we really have to look at what, what, where did the evidence originate? And then what is the expertise, either of the animal, the handler, or the soil that they collected and tested? 
So things change still in 2017. Dante is arrested in 2017 on an unrelated aggravated robbery charge. And while he is in jail waiting on that charge, a jailhouse informant provides information that gets Dante charged with the murder. Fellow inmate Ryan Rivera testifies in his trial that Lucas confessed to him that he killed Kelsey, but he'll never be convicted because police will never find the body. And Dante's attorneys said during trial that Rivera was just a liar. And what's also interesting is there are surveillance cameras in every single corner of every jail and every prison, but no one seemed to be able to find the uh, video that would support these two having a conversation. Look, I'm not saying that Ryan Rivera isn't telling the truth, but man, it is hard to put a case on a jailhouse informant who is facing, you know, charges of their own and are getting leniency for basically saying something that is so, I mean, I know he's saying something dramatic, but there's no information in that. Oh, he says he killed her, but they're never going to get him because they can't find her. Well, all of that is true. And you could have found that from reading, you know, anything online. Yeah. Um, I Again, a jury has listened to the evidence and they have found Dante Lucas guilty of murder. I am not suggesting otherwise. I'm just saying that these informants, unless they have a lot of information, I'm always a little bit skeptical. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, I'm not as troubled by the camera issue as some might be, because we see in, in like prison rape cases, there are so many areas in a prison that don't have camera coverage because it's not appropriate to have that. Oh, it might good point. be in the bathrooms, a shower. It might be in the cell where they're sleeping. So um, we have to then say, what are the possibilities that those conversations could have happened in a number of places that aren't covered by CCTV? Um, but then I just think it, it really by itself is really a frightening piece of evidence. But when you start to add it with all of the other pieces of the puzzle, then it starts to become pretty compelling. Like this witness who ends up not being able to testify because she's murdered a week before her tr her testimony. You what know, is how that about? What even, happened? Yeah, you can't even write that one, can you? <laughs> you couldn't create that. I'm still mystified by that. And she was supposed to testify, but then she gets killed, uh, there's an arrest for the murder of that witness. They say it was an issue that, um, domestic violence issue that escalated, but it is very bizarre, isn't it? I, I Oh, I, I feel the same way. Yeah. I, I, you just, you just scratch your head on that one. Right. So he gets charged with Kelsey's murder back in 2017, but Dante doesn't go to trial for almost four more years. So you can imagine how painful this process is for the family, for, for all the families involved. Yeah. During the trial, friends of Kelsey's testify about how the two met, that they met at junior college. Dante was playing on the school basketball team again. He was a six foot eight forward. They had this kind of on-again, off-again relationship over the years. Kelsey moved to California at one point, and Dante went to another school. They broke up. They got back together, broke up, got back together, and they were in their back-together phase. So the prosecutor said after the conviction that she felt the narrative of the domestic violence in this relationship and how abusive it was along with all the other parts of the suspicious behavior, the uh, the car, the stories that don't make sense, she's pregnant, she's not pregnant, all of this stuff really told a full story, apparently, to the jury that believed that Dante was responsible for Kelsey's murder. Laura Saxton, Kelsey's mom, spoke after the verdict, and Denver 7 covered this trial in the news conference 
And in this clip, her mother shares how she feared that this day would never come. There were times I thought we would never get to trial. That's how dire things seemed. Um, but I just didn't want to give up. I couldn't, I couldn't give up on Kelsey. So we're very, very thankful for, for this outcome. Um, but in the end, I didn't get Kelsey back. And that's what I wanted more than anything. So I feel like I didn't do something. I didn't push hard enough on something or I didn't look enough on something to, to bring her home. So I, I have to live with that the rest of my life. What pains me so much about listening to Kelsey's mother is that Kelsey's mother is beating herself up, in her words, failing to find Kelsey, that she as a mother has somehow failed because she hasn't been able to find her daughter's remains. And that is just heartbreaking. It is just so heartbreaking because, frankly, from the outside looking in and having spent some time with Kelsey's family and with the investigators on this case, you know, Kelsey's mom was the force behind pushing everyone to not give up, yeah. right? The lawsuit, the protests, the, the public pressure. You know, she went at it with the police. They had um, a terrible relationship for a long time, obviously. Yeah. And, but she wouldn't give up. And I remember when I met her and she brought with her all these photo albums of her Kelsey, you know. <laughs> And um, it's it's really sad. Yeah. It's sad to see a mom sit there with photos of their child and not have any answers as to where it happened to their child, you know, and feel like no one is helping it, even when they are helping, but it's not enough. So it, it pains me that she feels so hollow inside as if she failed when she she's accomplished so much. Yeah. But no, she has not gotten her daughter and she she had a call to action. Laura asked everyone to please not give up on searching, that if you're hiking, you're walking, you're doing anything, please never give up looking for her. And the other thing she said in the news conference was she said, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself now. I'm going to pack up my stuff from the motel room because she'd been living there for the trial. I'm going to go home and I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. Yeah, yeah. This is that heartbreaking. I, I, will, I don't think I will ever forget, Anna, her comment. Kelsey may now be able to sleep, but I will never be able to sleep. Um, and, and the fact that she said that um, sh her job is going to continue. We, we have not treated victims or victims' families well in our country, m maybe globally. Amen. I am yeah. with you right there. That is the that is the driving force of what I do and why I do it, because the system is not compassionate or supportive to victims, survivors, and their families. It undoes me. It undoes me. No one could possibly be prepared for losing a loved one in a horrendous, violent situation, but then no one could possibly be prepared for the coldness and the agony through which you go through in an attempt to get justice. And that's what gets me going. That's why I do what I do. Well, I'm sorry. You, I just, you, it just no, upsets no, me. So are, you are absolutely right. And, and, um, this is an area where I probably am the most critical of my own profession. And that is agencies that allow investigators to not have regular contact with their families. And some families can push too hard and make that a real miserable experience, but it shouldn't change the responsibility of that agency to monthly or bi-monthly or whatever the number is, reach out and say, we haven't forgotten. Or even on these really cold cases, you know, that are 20 years old or longer, to send an email to just say anything new from your end, because we're not stopping. Those things could be even automated, but it would let a family know that someone cares. And, and we've seen some great things happen in victim services and other areas. But but watching that mom was a perfect example. And holy cow, if she doesn't think she made a difference, that case wouldn't have gone forward. The public wouldn't have stood up. People like you wouldn't stand up and bang this drum, which gets 
thousands and thousands of people that'll stand in front of a police department and say, why isn't this case being investigated? Frankly, I just say hallelujah that people are willing to do that. And hopefully government is learning and evolving as we become more socialized as, as uh, people wanting to solve crime. We had a case on recently on the podcast a few podcasts ago where there had been, it was again, a no body murder case. There had been a conviction and something like seven years after the conviction, the body is found really not far from where she was last seen in this small town. So it is possible that Kelsey's remains may be found. And let's hope so, because that will answer a lot of questions and it will permit this family to move on to the next phase. There's just one more thing about healing and mourning. You know, I love what I do because I learn lessons. It, it's a constant evolution. My life is a constant evolution of learning. And I, I try not to stop learning. And I covered a, um, um, God, it's, it's so horrible to say, an execution in California. I've covered a few in Florida and in California. And this was a serial killer case. And I'll never forget, you know, I met, the, the families were from L.A. I went up to San Quentin, saw the families there. We we're all staying at the same hotel because there aren't that many hotels there. We're all at the same hotel. I see them in the lobby. I'm talking to them. I see them outside the execution. You know, they're all like, yes, and they're fired up because this is the day that they have been waiting for. And... um you know, then I'm live and I've got the family. The person's just been executed. They're, you know, popping champagne in the, um, whatever you think of executions. I, I'm not debating the death penalty. I'm simply telling this experience that I had based on the families of the victims. And so there's this sense of like, you know, relief. I'll never forget this, Mike. The next morning I saw them at breakfast. I have, never seen people so sad, so dejected, just like Kelsey's mother. Immense, immense sadness, emptiness, darkness. Because now, everything that they had put all their energy toward, right, is getting the killer of their loved one and getting ultimate and final justice in their eyes. And, the, and now... That goal was over, so what were they going to do because their loved one was still still gone? And so there's never yeah. really justice. No, no, I agree with you. And, and it, it seems like uh, when the words of anger or whatever come out of our mouth, they really never taste as good as we think they're going to taste. And it's, it's really tragic. Something really cool happened in the state of Utah, Anna, that I think uh, everyone should know about. The governor just signed into law in the last week and a half a law that requires any offender convicted of homicide where the victim has not been recovered, they are not eligible per, for parole until they help find the body. How cool is that? I like that. For a family like this. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I do. You know, I I do. Although, you know, that family I just told you about where there was the conviction, there was a nobody conviction. Yeah. When the killer um, was about to be sentenced, he said, I want to do a deal. He said, I'll tell you where the body is if you give me a lesser sentence. And the family thought about it. And the family said, no, oh, I am I not going to do a deal with the devil, number one. And number two. No, no. So you can get out and do this to someone else? No. It took a lot of fortitude for that family to say, I will not do a deal with this devil because well, my daughter is dead and you do not get to negotiate. It's like a hostage negotiator. Yeah, yeah. You're right. I've taken, I've kidnapped you. I've, I, I'm holding on to the remains and I'm not going to tell you unless you give me something. It's like the ultimate insult. And that family had incredible fortitude to say no. And ultimately, their loved one was found. But I do that like that law. Neat. I do like that law because, you know, and not all killers, convicted killers, are eligible for parole. Like in Dante's case, it's sentencing. The judge made it absolutely clear. He mm -hmm. is not eligible for parole. Now, he's super young. 
right? So he's in his 20s. Is it possible that he may try and cooperate? I don't know. Here's my suspicion. It is possible, no proof, I'm just asking the question, if he disposed of the body, did he do it alone? And maybe that is why he cannot come forward. Because remember, they dug at his grandmother's house. Not saying his yeah. grandmother had anything to do with it, but I wonder if there would be any implications against anybody else in his family. Well, and I think you've hit on something really important, because if it's true that he spoke to this inmate and confessed, if it's true that he spoke to this woman who was murdered in domestic violence a week before she testified, and that's true, um, it, it's evident that his personality is that he doesn't ne- normally do things alone or he shares information. There might be more um, people involved in this than we think. And then if others are covering up, you know, you just wonder how, how much responsibility people have. And those would be the people that I would appeal to with, from from the platform like this to say, you're better off going forward now and telling people what happened than having this case continue and build and, and you end up being a defendant down the road. So for our second case, we're staying in Colorado. And this is where we have what I would say is a bizarre update on the case of a missing mom, 49-year-old Suzanne Morphew. It has now been 10 months since Suzanne disappeared. Her husband, Barry Morphew, has reportedly sold the family home for $1.62 million. Now, the reason this is curious, I'm not even going to say suspicious, because The husband, we want to be absolutely clear here. The husband has not been named a person of interest, a suspect, nothing, nothing by police. Okay, so let's just, you can all speculate all you want, but in no way has he been named anything in relation to the disappearance of his wife. But here's why it's curious, because the last time that Suzanne was reportedly last seen alive was in that very home and by her husband. She was last seen on the morning of Mother's Day, May 10th of 2020. The husband told police that he saw her right before he left for Denver to go on a business trip. He has a landscaping job. The couple lived in the home with their two adult daughters, Mallory and Macy. And Barry, the husband, says, uh, this is what he told the Daily Mail and several news reporters who came around asking, why are you selling the house? And Barry said, look, I want to get rid of this house because my daughters are terrified that their mother was actually kidnapped, abducted from this very home. It is really scaring them. It has them unnerved. So I want to get out of here. And you know what, Mike? I kind of can understand that. But your face yeah, indicates yeah. otherwise. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I'm with you. I mean, how many of us would be a little bit creeped out by that? But how many also would think this is the one anchor point that this woman has? If there's any chance she's alive, do I really want to pull that away? Um, I think back of during like the Elizabeth Smart investigation and how the family continually pounded the drum that we're at home, we're here, we're ready. We, we, they, they wanted any effort to say there was a way that if Elizabeth were to hear a message that that family knew her, they loved her, they remembered her, they're waiting for her, her bedroom is still there, you know, and all of a sudden they're just pulling the rug out from under this woman. I, I know of a mom right now in southern New Jersey, a case that I covered 30 years ago. That little boy has never been found, and his mother is sitting in that same house 30 years later, and she won't move from that house because if, any, if he's still alive and there's any chance, she needs to know that he has a place to go, that he knows exactly where he lives. I can't. Countless, yeah. countless families who will never leave the home for fear that the person will show up to that location. And what if, God forbid, they're not there to help them, right? So that's how most yeah. families of missing people deal with this, but not all. Okay, and I get it. Maybe they don't want to be in this house. And they're like, you know what? Mom's a grown woman and she would know how to find us. And she has family and she could go here and she could go there. So, you know, 
let's say I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because what else is it other than curious? It's, it's not criminal by any means. Now, the FBI reportedly searched this house, this house that has been sold, twice after Suzanne disappeared. Barry told police that he believes Suzanne may have gone on a bike ride sometime after he left. Thing is, nobody remembers seeing Suzanne on a bike, and then later the bike was discovered on uh, the bike was discovered abandoned on a trail not far from the home. Suzanne was reported missing after her daughters, Mallory and Macy, were unable to contact her. They were out of state on a camping trip. The daughters called a friend and said, hey, can you go check on mom? The friend tries to check on mom, can't find mom. And it's the friend who actually calls police to say yeah. that Suzanne is missing, which is a little curious when you have a significant other, a husband. and But it's... It's interesting. Um, so Andrew Mormon, who is Suzanne's brother, believes that his sister was abducted and something horrible happened to her. And he just doesn't believe that she would leave the family and just like go off on her own. And it, there's been no indication or sign of life. And here's the other thing. For a while there, the uh, a, a theory was floated you know, the husband w was part of this theory. Maybe she was attacked by an animal and killed. I suppose that's possible. Yeah. But there are no signs of any kind of a vicious attack. And most animals who attack, you know, they don't eat at all. They would leave something. Yeah, I mean, let, let, let me just jump in on this because I'm just itching in my seat right go, now. Go, go, go. This was so frustrating to me, the, the mountain lion theory, and, and it was so frustrating that I reached out to the Mountain Lion Foundation, and I brought two biologists onto our program of, at Profiling Evil, and I said, let's talk about the behavior of a mountain lion. We actually used GIS, and we said, what is the historic distance that a mountain lion would drag its prey once it got it to hide it? Because a mountain lion's personality is to do exactly what you said. And, and this is kind of more morbid, but to chew a little bit on this thing and then hide it, bury it under some brush and other things and come back to it. It's always going to do that within about 150 yards where this kill site or attack site happens. And it's always going to be downhill and toward water if there's water. So it starts really limiting this area of possibility if, in fact, the mountain lion attacked Suzanne. There was no physical evidence to support any of that. And, uh, and you know, I asked them outright, and I had them show examples of other animals that had been killed by mountain lions. It is not a pristine site free of blood or torn clothing or scratch marks or drag marks. So that was absolutely baloney. What's your involvement in this case? Well, we were we were really fortunate because we were like you, just kind of listening and watching and talking a little bit about it. And Andy Mormon actually reached out and said, I want to put a search together because it's not happening locally. Can you help me? And so we we stepped in and we said we'd absolutely help. And we used some GIS and, and outfitted uh, up to 700 searchers that he arranged for to track them in real time as they searched areas so that we could provide the sheriff and the Colorado Bureau of Investigations a footprint of every piece of dirt that somebody walked and checked. We, um, we helped him with setting up a GoFundMe page that got him money to help pay for people's lodging and food while they were searching, which was really troubling to us because the family had set up a GoFundMe page that's never been accessed, never been had an expenditure come out of that we've been able to see. Which so, family? Because there are many families oh, involved yeah. here, right? And and let's make clear for anyone following along that Andy is Suzanne's brother, right? Yes. The, the missing woman's brother. And when you say family, there's the husband's side of the family. Because, you know, depending on who you talk to, you get a different picture. You have Suzanne's brother, who's very suspicious and concerned and is doing things like this, uh, supporting searches and cadaver searches, which we're going to get into. And then you have um, the family of the husband who says, you know what, these two were madly in love. Uh, they were a great family, a great couple. This is shocking. So, yeah. so okay, so, so please go ahead. Yeah. So thank you for clarifying that because 
Suzanne's husband and family on his side of the fence set up a GoFundMe page that grew quite rapidly. And the, and the uh, parameters of that were to pay for things like searches and, and uh, this ongoing effort to find Suzanne. When Andy Mormon, her brother, asked for some of those funds to put together a search, he was denied any access to that and set up his own GoFundMe that he used to pay for people that were coming in, to pay for lodging, to pay for food and water and other kinds of things. He paid his own way. Uh, and uh, I thought that was so impressive. He didn't use the GoFundMe money for that. He used it to look for his sister. He brought his dad on and we talked with Jean, her father, about uh, Suzanne. We did what I think is really important that hasn't been done. We we talked about the victimology. Who is Suzanne Mormon? Uh, what made her, Mormon Morphew, by the way, um, what made her this incredible human being? And, uh, and you know, it's just we saw these complete polar opposites. And, and uh, again, it's not an indictment on Suzanne's husband or her daughters, but they remained quiet and mom and her family, her brothers and sister stepped up and said, let's do this. Let's look for this woman. And it was just really troubling. And I oftentimes still cite Elizabeth Smart, whose mom and dad every single day was on the front of the news saying, help us find our daughter. We got a 30 second clip from her side of the family or from the husband's side. Well, let's be fair, in all fairness, that the husband did put together this video clip that says, Suzanne, if you're out there or anything, uh, what he offered a, a reward, a sizable reward. He He's offering a $200,000 reward for his wife's safe return. Yeah. And what you're you're suspicious and skeptical. No, no, no. I think it's so admirable that he would do that. I'm I'm troubled because uh, some people deal with grief much differently than others. And that's why I put this comparison of, of Ed and, and uh, Ed Smart, for instance, who every day is in front of the press saying, help me find my daughter. Kelsey Schelling's mom, who every day is saying, help me find my daughter. And then we have someone on Suzanne's side that doesn't do anything. And our family, brothers and sisters have to step up to organize a search. This isn't necessarily an indictment on Suzanne's husband or anyone else. Some people handle grief differently. It's just troubling because on the outside, as we look in, we see one side of the family saying, help me, help me, help me. Another side selling off property and moving away and moving on. Yes, I do want to talk about, about the property as well. Here, here, and here's another rift between Suzanne's brother and Suzanne's husband. Suzanne's brother wants the husband to take a police polygraph test. The brother says that the husband has twice refused. This has been reported by the Daily Mail. The husband says he's cooperating and has not been asked to take one. Honestly, I don't know which one is accurate. Do you? I don't either. And, you know, that's another interesting thing and, and a place where I think law enforcement could do a better job. The, this chief, for instance, in California City on the little boys that are missing, the West boys, was in front of the press every day saying, yes, we asked for a polygraph. No, I can't share the information on what the result was. Um, we're not getting that out of Salida and the sheriff's office there. It's very quiet there. And the family and, frankly, the public need to know a little more. I think that that's reasonable. I think that that's reasonable. Now, the as we said, that we've got two versions and two families, the, the, the Suzanne side and then the husband side of the family. What um, let's talk. I do want to talk about the properties for sale. But I also want to talk about what happened that night. I, I'm, I'm torn. I'm not sure which way to go. Okay, I'm going to go with properties for sale. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to go out of order here. Okay. So we know that the house has been sold, right? Here's what is also very curious. Suzanne's husband, Barry, recently sold another piece of property. This is just a two-acre piece of vacant land. And he sold it last month for $150,000, which is less than he paid for it a year earlier. Less than a year. Wait a minute. 
When did he buy this property? He bought this property after Suzanne disappeared. Now, that's not unusual, but what is curious is, is this not the land where her brother paid to bring in cadaver dogs? Yeah, and actually he didn't pay. Those were volunteer cadaver dogs uh, out of New Mexico that have been proven and have found bodies in Colorado. And uh, they they did alert in that same piece of property. Law enforcement came out and did search it and were unable to find anything. And some people have theorized a bunch of reasons why that may have happened, but it was in fact the same piece of property. And it was resold to the person he bought it from for $15,000 less. So originally he bought it from the developer of this uh, long Longhorn division or whatever. And he sold it back to the actual owner is from what I've been able to see on the property records. Uh, and, you know, he was smart enough to, to buy it back for less than he sold it for. But, but yeah, what we see again is this, uh, to me, this washing of hands of getting rid of all of my assets and responsibilities in an area, uh, for what reason? Who knows? Maybe to just go off and start a new life where people may not know who he is. He could also be short of cash. Could be. Uh, that's Although a possibility. With, with the sale of his house and his ability to, to maneuver through the conservatorship, he now has a bucket load of cash. So I don't know that that's necessarily a problem. Can you shed any light on the fact that he sold the house and Suzanne's name was on title as well? So how do you sell a house when someone's name is on there, but you can't locate them? You know, I found a couple of things that were kind of interesting. One was when they purchased the home um, several years earlier in 2018, uh, they actually purchased it and the documents went through without some key signatures because at the first of this year, they had to issue another warranty deed to fix a problem that occurred in 2018 where someone forgot to sign all the paperwork. And uh, and so they, number one, they fixed that on February 3rd. And, uh, and then four minutes, six minutes later, they then put in this uh, certificate of registration to to recognize a protective order from Indiana. So he actually had guardianship uh, awarded in Indiana. Colorado accepted that conservatorship. And uh, and then in that very same minute that they accepted that, they they uh, submitted all the paperwork and then and finished the health sale. So in effect, he lost, well, he made $50,000 on the house sale. He lost 15000 on the Longhorn property sale. But by the time he plays real estate fees and and whatever improvements he made on the property, he's probably going to lose quite a bit of money on the Puma Path property. But since he's got the conservatorship now and beat the system, he actually has a bucket load of money. So. Mike, you really lost me on the whole conservatorship oh, thing. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? D is she declared dead or she didn't have to sign for the sale? What does that mean? So um, it's it's a lot of legal that I don't understand. And and uh, But what happened is he got conservatorship of, of Suzanne's uh, holdings in Indiana. He then filed with those same conservator papers in Colorado, and Colorado accepted the guardianship of Suzanne from Indiana, which gave him guardianship in Colorado to sell the house and take the assets. So it's kind of like a legal way to go ahead, and uh, conservatorship sounds like the live version of uh, an executor for a will, kind of like the whole Britney Spears thing. Her father's the executor is in charge of all of her finances and legal things and how that's working its way through. Is is that fairly accurate? Well, yeah, and I, and I am no legal mind. I have just asked lawyers in Colorado to help me understand what's going on with this. And that's kind of the description I got. But what we do have are the actual documents that are public record that show this certificate of registration and recognition of a protective order from another state, in this case, Indiana, which then gives um, Barry the authority to sign for and in behalf of Suzanne and lead to that house sale. 
Very interesting. You, the man who profiles, you read anything into this or this is just a guy figuring out how to sell the house that is girls can't stand? Yeah, I mean, it, it very well may be. And and hopefully it just becomes a way for him to continue to to fight to find his wife. And and uh, um, gosh, I, I don't know. It's it's interesting that that he has to go through these hoops to do that, because in some states, I uh, my understanding is they would have to wait a period of five or seven years to be able to do that. He found a way to to avoid that. Yes, it's the speed in which sometimes things are done that I always find curious. Yeah. So let's talk about the last time Barry and Suzanne saw each other based on the reporting of the Daily Mail. They reported that on the night before Suzanne vanished, that Barry spent the evening at a hotel, budget hotel. I don't know why that's so important that it's a budget hotel. Um, budget hotel in Denver. And that when he left the room, the room was reeking of chlorine. Okay, it is, there is a pandemic. I'm just going to toss that out there. A man named Jeff Puckett, who's 49 years old, is a co-worker of Barry's, said that he was ordered to Denver by Barry that morning, but didn't see him because he had already left the motel room because of a family emergency. Jeff told the DailyMail.com, quote, I got there Saturday night and the room smelled like chlorine real bad and that there were wet towels everywhere. Okay, well, that kind of sounds like a motel room, wet towels everywhere. The manager at the property confirmed to the Daily Mail that they do not use chlorine to clean guest rooms, but I might say it's not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> and that <laughs> they handed security footage from that weekend to the police. Jeff, the co-worker, also said that he discovered a pile of mail in the room, including a letter about property insurance, and later turned that over to the FBI. I don't know whether that's significant in any way. And to be clear, the sheriff's office has not named any suspects or persons of interest. No arrests have been made. And Suzanne's case is still classified as a missing persons case. What do you make of the Daily Mail's reporting? Yeah, I, from what I've learned, it, it I don't think is quite accurate. Uh, Lauren Sharp, a reporter in the area, um, made a, a, a really nice uh, report and showed in the interview with Puckett and a female employee. The female employee recalled hearing Barry's truck outside of her residence at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning on the morning of Mother's Day. Um, they had been given orders to drive that day, Mother's Day, uh, the employees to Denver to do this surprise job. Now, I've heard that he checked in the night before, but that doesn't coincide with her testimony or his saying, I left at 5 a.m. and headed to Denver. Um, that's when he says he last saw Suzanne was at 5 a.m. as he's heading out to go to Denver. Uh, it wasn't even a budget motel. It was actually, I think, uh, like a, a, a like a Hampton Inn or Fairfield Inn kind of a yeah, hotel. Yeah, those so, are great places. <laughs> yeah. That's where Crime Watch Daily always put me up. I always <laughs> loved it. Free breakfast. <laughs> yeah. It, and actually, if you look at the property, it's a brand new hotel. So it's not a budget hotel like no, they suggest. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. You, you know, I sometimes I think it's the perspective if people maybe from other countries or something like that, how they view our hotels. But those are fine hotels. Absolutely. But, but that's the weird thing is it's Mother's Day. So is this normal behavior for him to just get up and leave on a Mother's Day? Is it normal for the kids to be sent away to, to church camp over Mother's Day? You All say sent things, away. You're very, um, I'm, you're parsing your words and I'm listening to every one of them. Sent away? What does that mean? What do you well, mean by that? It, it, there, was, there was apparently a church camp or something that the girls were involved with. So it could have been, you know, absolutely and they're, these are older girls, they, they could have absolutely wanted to do this coming home on Mother's Day. Uh, I don't want to have anything read into that, that comment other than they were away. And then he suddenly gets up and drives away. The thing that becomes so interesting are um, the little pieces of evidence that suggest that there was texting going on between Suzanne and a friend the night before, that there's frustration, there's concerns, and then all of a sudden there's behavioral changes in the texts 
And Andy Mormon talks about his sister actually starts trying to friend his friends on Facebook, which is completely out of character for her at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night on the ninth, the night before Mother's Day. So you start looking at all those kinds of things and you just say, how normal is it that this guy on Mother's Day would go do work and drive away on Mother's Day? Um, how normal is it that his daughters would call and say, hey, we can't reach mom. That makes really good sense. We're trying to wish her Mother's Day. So he calls the neighbor and says, hey, go check out the house and see if you can find her. And the neighbor says, can't find her. And then he says, oh, well, maybe go check and see if her bike's there because she likes to go bike riding. Well, th those are just really interesting things because she goes back and the bike's missing now. And that leads to this search and and the discovery of the bicycle and, and then the four theories on what may have happened. So you just look at all those and you say, wow, how, how coincidental or how perfectly planned are these things? I don't know, but she's been missing for 10 months and there's no sign of her. So I don't read anything positive or good into that. Yeah, and, and I don't see anybody looking, but I'm not living in Salida I just hear people from Salida who say, uh, other than the people, it doesn't appear a lot's happening. Hmm. Very, very suspicious. Well, again, sheriffs have said clearly, though, that they have not ruled out foul play. And um, there is something that's interesting about the husband, Barry. He recently did some television interviews. He said he was very frustrated. People were saying nasty things about him, and he didn't like it. It was time to speak up. So um, also what he has said is, this is what Barry, the husband, says about the police. Quote, the, po the police have screwed this whole thing up from the beginning, and now they're trying to cover it up and blame it on me. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm just going to leave it there because we've got nowhere else to go with it. Yeah, it's interesting when when um, we quit thinking about Suzanne and we think about our own victimization instead. I don't know. You don't like it. I, it's just I don't. I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew him and the daughters so that I could just kind of in my own mind say, is this normal? Because for the rest of us, it just doesn't seem like normal behavior, but it might be absolutely normal for that family, the way they're acting. It is time now for our comments section. And these are the crime stories you all are talking about. And our, I don't want to call him webmaster. It's like you are the king of the web of true crime daily who monitors all of I'll this and it. keeps the machine going. Our Owen Michael is here now with your comments. Hi, Anna. Hi, Mike. Glad to be here today. Um, we've got a couple of stories. You know, we get comments on our uh, social media. We get it on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and Instagram, of course. Um, this first story we've got, uh, this is a video you may have seen. It went viral this week. Oh, so, my God. Craziness. Craziness. There was, a, uh, there was a brawl that was recorded on cell phone video in Scottsdale. Uh, Scottsdale is a fancy part of Phoenix in Arizona, of course, uh, at the Fashion Square Mall. Two women were sighted after this, uh, this Bath and Body Works brawl, of all places. Um, background is Scottsdale police said two women were sighted after a brawl broke out at a Bath and Body Works inside Scottsdale Fashion Square Mall on Saturday. An argument uh, started between two groups of people that were waiting in line to check out, uh, and it quickly became physical. Uh, a couple of store employees had to get involved. Uh, the attempt to break up the fight and eject everyone involved. Uh, the employees themselves looks like uh, there was some blows exchanged with everyone involved. Fortunately, police cited uh, two women, 25 and 45, for assault and disorderly conduct. Police said both women were released at the scene, so apparently it was uh, it blew over quickly. Um, it's unclear how the, the thing started. Scottsdale police said they don't believe it was uh, racially motiv motivated or related to COVID-19 rules and restrictions. I think uh, restrictions. it was about, th they were arguing about cutting the line and who was next, and it escalated Indeed. from there, right? And it's, and it's unfortunate that uh, police have to clarify that since uh, there's been such a rash over the last year of uh, uh, fights over both of those things. But uh, 
all's well that ends well for the moment anyway. Uh, people had a big reaction to that. Luna L says, um, I don't think the chill out lavender candle scents are working. How about some sage? Uh, like, you know, sage has its, uh, has its qualities. I'm not sure how Bath and, ba- uh, Bath and Body Works, uh, what their stock is on that. But, uh, and, and you know this from dry. personal history? Uh, you know, on, I've had, on soothing um, scents? Uh, uh, a past girlfriend was a big fan of uh, uh, smudging. Is that what they call it? Uh, yes. Doing the sage treatment to, yes. in, in and our space. Yes, and that's true. Yes, it's, so, it, that, that goes back for centuries and centuries. And indeed. indigenous people uh, believe in the curative and healing powers and just clarifying. Keep clarifying, right. absolutely. Right. Which yeah, I don't they, know what that says about my own household, but uh, uh, it is what it is. Smudge away. Uh, <laughs> Laura W says, I get it. Don't take the last coconut colada foam foam excuse me foam foaming hand soap. Wow, um, people know they're obsessed with these products. You know these apparently are. Uh, I'd like to get my hands on these too. But uh, as Amanda R says, <laughs> see online shopping. Yeah, well, you know be. the brawl was was crazy. But what I was fascinated by because you said that the workers there got involved, and all all the workers you could see them because they were the ones with the blue aprons on. Mm-hmm. So they're like yeah. jumping on top of the people who are fighting, trying to pull people apart. So it's like people in aprons, and well, it was like a, place- a part- there was like a partition in the line that kind of got uh, uh, into the brawl as well. So they were all tangled up in the stuff. It's a mess. You can go to our Facebook page. We've got it uh, on True Crime Daily uh, uh, on the Facebook page. We've got that video there if you'd like to take a look. Leave your own comment, of course. Um, we do have another staying in Phoenix, uh, going cross town. We've got another uh, story out of Arizona. Police said a Phoenix man called to report a possible break-in at his apartment. Uh, he allowed responding officers into his apartment to investigate where they found a large quantity of drugs in plain view, police said. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll show a, a photo of that. There's quite a uh, incriminating amount of uh, illegal-looking substances here. Uh, everyone's innocent until proven guilty, of course. Uh, officers also said that there was no sign of a break-in at the residence. So uh, this guy called the cops on, uh, it's not clear why. John Harbison was arrested for possession and sale of dar- dangerous narcotics. Uh, Latigua H said he must, have been getting, he must have been getting high off his own supply. I think it's very possible. Seems, uh, indications seem to be that way. Yeah. Zach T, uh, he calls it uh, Valley of the Spun. Um, and Julie S says, uh, it's messed up. <laughs> yes, it is indeed messed up. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, they, you know, they always say it's it's the judgment that goes first when you get involved in alcohol and drugs. So, <laughs> And this may be a great example of it. Well, all right. Don't do drugs. Don't sell drugs. Uh, you know, maybe <laughs> yeah. stay away from drugs in general. Stay in oh, school. Lord. That's right. Oh, my God. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Owen. Always good seeing you. We'll see you next week. See you next Thanks, week. Owen. Bye. So, Mike, before we go, I want to hear a little bit more about your book. You were telling me before we started recording that you've been fighting Satan, that that seems to be like <laughs> part of your job description is to physically fight Satan. You know, it's interesting. After I finished this case that the book is written about, I was hired by the uh, Utah Attorney General to head up the Ritual Crime Task Force back in the early 90s when we were uh, – we had this big satanic panic going across the United States and around the world. Everyone was sure it was kind of the false memory syndrome period of time. And, and uh, there were literally hundreds of cases that we collected from law enforcement and uh, investigated and, and uh, used over the course of this uh, this period of time to try to understand the challenges. From there, I evolved and, and uh, was assigned to, to look into polygamy. But um, so I've spent much of my career looking at these closed societies and these secret societies, uh, cults, uh, and uh, and that's what the book is written about. Well, there seems to be no shortage of these groups. I know it was, as we say, it may have been a fad and there may have been a lot of them at a certain period of time, but they never really go away. You know, they just no, get new ones. Exactly. In fact, they say at any given time, there's somewhere between five and 6,000 cults operating around the world at any given period of time. So there's no country that's free of them. And cults can be destructive in nature. There could be, I mean, gosh, believing in your favorite sports team, some people would consider 
to be a, a cult, according to some experts. Politics, some people, the experts say, would consider that to be a cult. But what I focused on and what this book focuses on is destructive cults. In this case, a cult of about 120 people that were sexually abusing children. Oh, it's so awful. It's so awful the things that people do in the name of God and, and how they harm children, the innocent, always the innocent, just horrible. Yeah, isn't that something to take something deity that is so special and, and again, so un known we can't grab hold of it and say what is this but we have this belief system and to somehow pervert that and say unless you violate the law or unless you allow me to have sexual relations with you or unless you remain quiet god is going to somehow condemn you what talk about the very vilest of criminals well mike it has been a pleasure having you on we will where can people find you are you on social media uh, May yeah, need so your, it, may it, need your it, mapping it, skills. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can go to at Profiling Evil, and that kind of gets you on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, and uh, or go to ProfilingEvil.com, and, and folks can order the book there. So thank you so much, Anna. And, and uh, gosh, what an honor it's been to be on your show today. Well, thank you. So um, you can always find me. Um, everywhere on social media, Anna G News, Anna with one N. I sometimes talk about crime, but mostly about weird things like chihuahuas or food or who knows what. Um, just my thing. <laughs> As always, you can find our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and on YouTube, of course. Get updates and subscribe to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. That way, Owen Michael can send you his newsletter directly. And uh, until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. Don't do crime.